It's kind of like we'd go from this mild-mannered Clark Kent to Superman because there's somebody that needs to be served. And we're there empowered by it. And it's like this is what happens is the more we do it, the more we feel like we're hardly ever going back into our alter ego. We never, we never turn back into Peter Parker. We stay Superman or Spider-Man all the time now because everywhere we're looking, we're like, oh, I just feel so good whenever I get to serve somebody. I'm looking around all the time. Can I tell you what servanthood, what that whole con, that's what love is. Love is when I get myself off my mind, when I get me and my, what about me off my mind, all of a sudden I'm looking around everywhere for somebody to serve. That looks like love. Go with me to uh, Mark chapter 10. Um, and let's just take a quick look here at verse 15. Because sometimes it can be, you know, I, I, let me share this scripture first. It says, Jesus speaking here, you know that it's Jesus because it's how? Because it's written in red. Red letters are, are as important as all the other letters, except they're most important letters. When Jesus is speaking, remember, like, this is the guy, this is that person who is the ultimate expression of the full potential of what a human being can be. That's what Jesus was. We've been talking about that in this discussion we've been having about the, Jesus being a superhero and, uh, you know, what it would be like to have been with Jesus when he was here on this planet. And so we know whenever we're reading the red letters, we're listening to somebody who everybody else is going, oh my gosh, I'm in the presence of a superhero. I'm like, this guy is Superman. He can walk on water. He can raise the dead. He can heal the sick. He can turn invisible. He can all the other stuff, you know. Just it's this almost magical human being that's in their presence. And so when Jesus would speak, these words would be like so powerful. It's like if you were, you know, believing to be a businessman or an investor or something like that. And Warren Buffett or Bill Gates came in the room and started talking. He's like, man, you'd be riveted to what he said, even if you thought what he said was dumb, right? You would still go, oh my gosh, because you know these guys know what they're talking about. Imagine what it would have been like for Jesus when he was here, that he could do these most extraordinary and supernatural things around us. Man, when he spoke, it would be like, yikes. His words have got real weight. Can you feel that? Listen to what he says in verse 15. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, Whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. Let's flip it around. So you have to receive the kingdom of God as a little child. Not even a child. A little child. And so we go back to what Jesus said. It. Whoever will not receive it this way, what does he say? He says, you shall not enter. Isn't that crazy? Jesus is saying, if you want to do what I do, you want to become a superhero like me? Jesus speaking, you want to possess your, you know, the very identity and the created divine person that God created each, each human being to be. If you don't come as a little child, then you ain't going to get it. You're not going to get this by thinking that it's something that you get with your PhD. The key to the kingdom is on the floor. That's why people can't find it. It's at the basic level. The people of the book of Acts were not at all an educated group of people. Now, Jewish people were more educated than anybody else that would have been on the planet because that was part of their culture. But compared to what we call education today, people were not educated. And yet, and this, there was no written scriptures. The, the, the stuff we read was not written when the book of Acts came about when all of these miracles and this supernatural explosion of the kingdom of God around the world, there was nothing written down. No, no, there were no Bible schools, no colleges, no Bibles. There was Old Testaments, but no New Testaments. And so Jesus says here, wait a minute now. We got, so us as North Americans, we got to do a checkup from the neck up. 
we got to say, okay, am I thinking that I'm going to go and read Ezekiel and translate some cool Hebrew or, or uh, Chaldean words in order to get this upper revelation that's been hidden from man since the beginning of time? You know, this great mystery that is preventing. Nope, that's not how it's, it's not in the book of Revelation. Jesus says, you know, it's been given unto you to know the mystery of the kingdom. And he's talking in children's stories. And he says here, wait a minute, to all of you people who think that it's going to take a superior intellect, you know, this amazing, you know, Mensa-level intellect in order to understand how to enter the kingdom of God, he says, just by the fact you got that, you're probably going to stumble. It's going to be easier for a little child to make it into the kingdom. So when we talk about this, you know, let, let's look at the kingdom from the metaphor, the modern metaphor of a superhero. And people think, you know, oh, that's so childish. Yeah. Because when we try to identify with what it would have been like for Jesus to be here on this planet and be one of his disciples... The, the, it's, it's almost been a magical thing that God has done for us in our culture by making all of these superhero movies. Can I tell you something? Every time I, not much anymore, it's kind of like they're going a little long for me now. I don't even really watch them. But back in the, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, when God was trying to get my mind to understand the things of the kingdom, he was using movies and superheroes in order to do that. Some of my most transfer, when I saw, all of a sudden I realized, I could see it on the screen and I could see what, and you know, God, the Holy Spirit is always talking to you. How many of you know that? I don't recommend you go to movies that are, you know, bad movies, scary movies are worse than swearing movies, but swearing movies are bad too. <laughs> but the, God, the Holy Spirit can talk to you in the middle of those moments and he's going like, do you see what I'm showing you? Can you see what is in the children's story that I'm trying to get revealed to you right now? And a lot of the time, it's been in those moments of watching superhero movies or those kind of like surreal kind of movies that are God enabling my mind to open up and stop being so intellectual, stop being so North American about the way you think about things and let me talk to you as I would talk to a little child. And when we're dealing with it now, as we sort of even take this humorous trip through this understanding of how transformative the lives of the disciples were because of their exposure to this person, Jesus, and the supernatural, in a sense, or superpowers that Jesus had when he was here. And then he says to people here that if you don't come as a little child, then the kingdom, you're going to miss the door to the kingdom. And so a lot of times what, we're, what I think the Lord is trying to do, I can't tell you the feedback I've got on this teaching. I've taught some phenomenal teachings, and this is probably the dumbest one I've ever taught. And the feedback I get from people finally get, I get it. I get what God is trying to show us. In this modern age, when uh, of you know, two thousand years away from actually spending time with the physical Jesus, and sometimes we can become lost in our you know, are we experiencing Jesus the same way Peter did, the same way John did, the same way the other disciples did? And I would say, I would suggest, unless we can get through to seeing him as a superhero, then we're probably going to still see him as our this religious figure who you know, wears a dress and floats about three feet above the ground and has a very sad face because his life is so hard and terrible and I'm just so miserable. Would you be miserable if you raised people from the dead? Would you be miserable if you just fed 20,000 people with, a, with one filet of fish sandwich? Would you be miserable if you went fishing and paid your taxes? I don't think you'd be miserable. I think you'd be overjoyed. Everywhere Jesus went, people who, lepers, people who were missing stuff, the stuff grew back on again. And he sent them home to their families. Oh, it's just such a terrible job that I have. Jesus would not be like that. Not with all the stuff we know about him in the scriptures. Like, this would have been, Jesus would have, he was like waiting for the sun to come up. 
Wouldn't you be waiting for the sun to come up? And so we've got this whole wrong picture. And when we get the right picture, now we're saying, okay, wait a minute. I, th I thought I kind of want I guess if I had to be like you, Jesus, I would like to be like you. But you're kind of miserable and boring. And, and then you realize that he was anything but miserable and boring. How much more excited are we to be like him? Amen. When our, our lives could be so transformed and so we could live on this planet also as though we were superheroes. Can I tell you something? You, know, you don't know if the person behind you in the coffee shop is, is going home to commit suicide. We've had stories like that. People we were at the tent. Wasn't that last year? Somebody at the tent, you know, we had the tent down there and for the water baptism, and somebody was wandering there along the shore, and that's what they were thinking of doing. And so one of us, you know, I don't know who it was. I can't remember now. So wandered up to him and just said hello, and da 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 We saved that, that you know, that's a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal to their family, that girl's family. It's a big deal to her boyfriend or husband or father or mother. And it's amazing. You know, you stand behind somebody in a coffee shop and, you know, all of a sudden God says, buy their coffee. And it's like, we can, we can do serious damage to a person's plans to destroy their lives of just buying them a coffee. Just saying, hey, we, you're awesome. Just tip good next time you go to the restaurant. You know, you don't know that 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 fellow or that girl going home to some serious financial problems and just you being encouraged, just flip them an extra couple of dollars. What does it matter to you? Ooh, talking about my money again. Okay, so, you know, that's why we got to prosper. You know, I tell you something, not gonna, you, don't have to, you don't have to prosper so you can... You know, just walk around and show everybody all your fancy stuff and look what I got and tough bananas if you don't got one. and do it. That's not what you got to prosper for. You got to prosper so your tip's bigger than your bill. That's why you got to prosper, right? Uh, you, now, clap, clap, clap. You can all do it today. Oh, 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 oh. It's Wednesday night, folks. I don't have to be nice on Wednesday night. But you know, you can do that, you know. You can be a, you know, people say, you know, oh, if I was Bill Gates. No, nah, you are Bill Gates. Right? You are. You have the power. Right? You live in abundance. Don't worry. You're never going to run out. When we know God's our source, then we're never going to run out. A lot of times where we get into trouble is we learn that God's our source, and then we start pouring it upon ourselves. That's where you can get in a little bit of trouble. But I can tell you. You're not going to get in trouble by giving more away than you should. <laughs> Ever. You know, it's not going to happen. Okay, that didn't go over very well. But. You know, that's what it takes to have superpowers. That's, that's what superpowers look like. You know, why we love Superman and why we love Batman. And they just, you know, Batman just flies off of the edge of a building. Yeah. Right? Because he, he's just fearless. He just, I'm going to help this person. Yeah. You know, and so we become, when we really step into our superpowers, we know that there's a transformation that has to happen on the inside of us. It's not just, you know, I'm just going to go, you know, give away all my money to prove Pastor Ian that I'm really going to run out. You know, that's not good. Don't, don't do that. Right? What we're doing is we, we have to build our superpowers and we have to be in this place where we are experiencing the divine flows of these things into our lives which does take a little bit of transition time. But when we get our minds straight to say, this is what a Christian's ought to be like. This is what it really means to have superpowers. It doesn't mean that, you know, you ever notice, I don't know why I'm just, I don't know why I do notes, you know, I should not even do notes. You know, when we take a look at, you know, there's always a good, whenever there's a superhero movie, there's also a bad guy. And the bad guy typically has superpowers just like the superpower guy has. Right? I didn't quite get the Batman versus Superman thing. You know, I, just, I don't think that's a good fight. But there's usually a bad guy who is just as, like, uh, you think about Sherlock Holmes, and then there's um, Moriarty, thank you, all you people who read, um, or watch the movies, I suppose. <laughs> but you know that Moriarty has just as smart as, as Sherlock Holmes. And, but he's evil. And what makes him evil is his manner, his, his, it's all about himself, right? And so a lot of times our superpower, if I could tag on what I was going to get to the middle here, just in case I run out of time, is that 
the one, the, 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 probably the most powerful piece of our superpower, our bat belt, is our ability to love. I can tell you, I, you've, you've all noticed it. This is a cause and effect thing again here. You've all noticed how, you know, you can walk down the street in Toronto and nobody looks at you. Do you notice that? You can do it here too now. But if you call the person out, you know, you wait till you can, you know, you know, hey, how are you? You know, it's like, they're almost like that affects them. Yeah. Now, you know, be careful because I'm going to get you in jail. But there's, when you say hello to that person or make, take the risk of smiling at somebody who's got a miserable look on their face, you impacted that person's life. You changed their life because they smiled back at you. Now you're, now you're gone from their memory about three feet from now. Yeah. But you've made an impact into that person's life. That's just a smile. Walk up to somebody tomorrow. You you know, just put a $10 bill in your pocket. Walk up to somebody tomorrow and say, you know what? I just wanted to bless you. $10. That's almost nothing. Watch what your love does. Even if that person doesn't need the $10. Find somebody in a Ferrari and give them $10 and you'll see that person's life change right before your eyes. They'll look at you like, what just happened to me? You see, it's that ability that we have. It's a superpower. And as we learn to develop it, I can tell you with with as much certainty as I have on the inside of me, that this next move of God, the one that we all can sense, the, the ground swell, you know, you can hear a train a-coming. Yeah. This revival that's about to hit the earth, the one that is going to be the in-gathering or bigger than, than all the other revivals that have been experienced since the book of Acts, yes. and it's going to ride higher than that. Can I tell you how basic the revelation is going to be of what that's going to do to spread around the world? It's going to go like this. God loves you. But can I tell you something? We cannot, God has always loved us. It's not, we're going to say, oh, God finally woke up and decided to love us. That's not how this is going to work. What happens is we open the door to begin to experience the love of God that has always been poured out towards us, been being poured out towards us. We just haven't, we haven't realized it. You know, we could be in a marriage and when you're in a marriage you, and you never open the door to the other person in your marriage to love them first, then you, get, you come back in five years and you'll say the other person doesn't love you. That's not true. I mean, it might be true, but it's probably not true. Why didn't you experience the love that came back is that you never opened the door. When we learn to open the door by loving somebody else, what happens is we begin to experience the love of God in our life, even if a trickle, even if it's just a drop. What happens then is we start to have this groundswell of people who don't have God loves you as a, you know, I learned this in church the other day. I have this God loves me because I can feel the love that he has towards me. I can feel it when I wake up in the morning. I can feel it in the expression of other people towards me. You know, I said, this is what I said to the Lord a few years ago. I've said this to you before, that a couple of years ago, and I came into this understanding, you know, everything is faith, hope, and love. We got the faith thing. We've been working on the hope thing. But let me tell you, this love thing in, the, in our North American culture is completely elusive to us. But when we get the love thing, we're going to see this whole world like a wave go across with the kingdom of God expressing its people are going to get breakthroughs what we work all we work for for by faith is easier by hope it's almost instantaneous by love that when you realize God loves you what happens all fear goes well it's not magical if I, if, if as a human being, you know, if, if John Pecorero loved me and I know he's packing and he's built like a, like a football player, if he loves me, then we go into a bad situation. He's going to protect me. I've got nothing to be afraid of because I know he's got my back, right? If John, God, if God loves me, he's never going to see me go short. 
if God loves me, he's never going to leave me stranded. He's never going to see me injured. Like not, not to think things aren't going to happen, but I'm never going to get injured by them. It is going to make me stronger. And you see, when we can understand this, anyways, so love then, getting a, a revelation of the love of God, love is our primary superpower. We can do the faith and hope thing too, go transform lives all over. Yeah, we should do that. But the love thing, I think this is why people freaked out when Jesus came around. Ever been around somebody who like loves you? Like go to grandma's house? You know, you'd be having a bad day. You know, next thing you know, you got lipstick all over your face, some funny shade they haven't sold in 30 years, you know, it's all over your face. It's just like, oh. You see, love is just amazing. And I think that's what happened when people were around Jesus. He just, they felt loved. But not the, not the religious people. They wouldn't open the door. Jesus was loving them just as much. He'd heal them just as much. But they never opened the door. What we need to learn to do, I think, is we need to learn how to open the door by loving other people and then experiencing the love of God poured back towards us. And as we grow... In a, in, a, in a world that is, is like infected with selfishness. It's infected with, what about me? It's very hard to learn what love is in a world where everybody is sick with, what about me? And then if, you know, you know what, what Romans says, you know, you, we think that other people think the way we think. So that must be what God, if I think, it, what about me all the time, then I think God is thinking, what about me all the time? And so he's not, but that's what we think he's thinking. You know, they have an offering as, oh, God wants my money again. <laughs> no, God doesn't. You know, we do, but God doesn't. We have the wrong idea, even though he's loving us. Do you see that? We're not perceiving it. We don't have the door open. And so because we don't have the door open, we don't perceive it. We have to get the door open lots by loving other people. Can I tell you, let's just go to our, what I was going to talk to you tonight about was the um, understanding our superpowers. This is on page five. But one of, the, the, one of our superpowers is our ability to serve other people. You know, I was in, uh, Tina and I were down, where were we recently? Just where were we? We went somewhere. We were in a Starbucks it was in a Target. We were in Pennsylvania. And in front of us in line was two, pe two moms, but both with daughters. L baby, little, uh, whatever, what would that be? That would be uh, t three. The two daughters, they didn't know each other, and, but they both were there in front of the line. And the little girls were kind of playing with each other. One of the little girls was super introverted, and the other little girl was super extroverted. You can imagine what that kind of played out like. But the mom of the little girl who was extroverted said these words to the other mom. She said, I forget the little girl's name, but the, she said the little girl's name is energized when she is with other people. Now I think about that. And the Lord drew my attention to that. And he, he was saying was, like if you took that little girl who was the extrovert and you took her home to play by herself, she would lose her, a lot of her extroversion. You might notice this in friends of yours if you are, or yourself if you are extroverted. But when you get in a crowd, it's like you... <laughs> so I'm not standing by Lizzie for any particular reason here. When you get in a crowd, it's all of a sudden you take on this alter ego. You be, your, your superpowers start to come out. How many of you have noticed that? Can I tell you something? As, as a Christian, being a servant or serving other people should be like that. Like if we're not serving, you know, we're just feeling, oh, you know, oh, I'm being served right now. You know, I'm in a restaurant and they're looking after me and all I'm doing is sitting here and eating. It's just like no fun at all, you know, I guess. Feel very disempowered. But you tell me to go in the kitchen and help, now I'm empowered. Somebody in the room walks in with a cane, I'm empowered now because I can serve somebody. Somebody walks in and they got a long face, I, can, I got something to do now. 
And what happens is, is all of a sudden, it's like we take on this alter ego. Kind of like we'd go from this mild-mannered Clark Kent to Superman because there's somebody that needs to be served. And we're there empowered by it. And it's like this is what happens is the more we do it, the more we feel like we're hardly ever going back into our alter ego. We never, we never turn back into Peter Parker. We stay Superman or Spider-Man all the time now because everywhere we're looking, we're like, oh, I just feel so good whenever I get to serve somebody. I'm looking around all the time. Can I tell you what servanthood, what that whole, con that's what love is. Yeah. Love is when I get myself off my mind, when I get me and my, what about me off my mind, all of a sudden I'm looking around everywhere for somebody to serve. That looks like love. And when we do that, when we open the door that way, all of a sudden now we're realize, we can, we, our, our, our perception is there to understand a little bit more about the love of God that's being poured towards us all the time. We just don't perceive it because the door's closed. Because our culture has taught us that we're supposed to be trying to get served. Right, the real, you know, I want to be a billionaire so that I can be served, really. That's not that much fun. Be a billionaire, but be a billionaire so that you can take your money and go serve somebody. Go figure out how to change the world. Go do it with $100 for sure, but be prosper so that you can expand your ability to serve people. Because what starts to happen is when we will first become a servant, then God opens up the doors as we become more and more and more and more and more of a servant. Before long, you're serving the whole wide world. Can I tell you, that's what God wants. God wants your superpower serving the entire world. And the stronger you get, the more you enjoy it. Because your true identity isn't Clark Kent. Your true identity isn't Bruce Wayne. Your true identity is your superpower. That you were born to be a superhero. That's why Jesus, when he came here, he didn't just be the only superhero. You know, I said, I, I, I don't know if I said this from the pulpit. I hope you don't take this wrong when I say it. But Jesus did not come to save the world. He came to teach the, his disciples to save the world their world, whose disciples finally became you. And Jesus is saying to you, would you go save the world? Now, it took Jesus' sacrifice in order to open our eyes. We couldn't even see the kingdom if we did not first see Jesus, if we did not first get set free from the bondage of sin and deception. But now that we're free from that, the rest of the work that Jesus did, you know, the teaching ministry, the time he worked with his disciples, that was all about getting an image in their mind so that they could see that God intended them to be supermen, them to be a superhero. Look in Acts chapter 4, and I'll just close with this just so that I feel like I've done something I planned on doing tonight. Uh, where are we here? So go to Acts chapter 4. Let me read you just a couple scriptures, and we'll just let the scriptures talk to us. Listen to this, Acts chapter 4. This is the beginning of the book of Acts. Really, we hadn't, Jesus has only left two chapters ago. And it says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Listen to that. So what we're doing here is like, oh, you don't, I don't have enough education. Is that what you said? I'm not trained. Is that what you said? That doesn't matter. These were all of the people, the educated and trained people around looking at disciples of Jesus and saying like, what? what? But listen to what's going on here. Look, they were uneducated, untrained men. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. They had been one of Jesus' disciples. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Now, these are people who want to say something against it. They want to say this is all a farce. This is just some show. You know, I prayed for them and you pushed them down. This is you're taking up an offering because you're trying to make money. That's people want to push them down. 
They want to say that these guys are not doing miracles. But listen, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred amongst themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them. Now, translate. What's really going on inside of these people, who, these, these, these upper educated rulers of the city, is they were saying, I just saw these guys do something like, like Superman does. That, their context here was saying God and Mira, and that's certainly our context too. But when we think about it, what they were watching was this person using their superpower to do something that was absolutely impossible to do. This was a disciple of Jesus, two of the disciples. For indeed that a notable miracle had been done through them, it is evident to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny. Everybody in Jerusalem could see that Peter and John, through their ministry, through their lives, these, this fella got healed. A supernatural thing that must have gone like what we, wow, like this is amazing. I was here a couple weeks ago, and that Jesus fella, he did that. And we crucified him. Not, you know, it, 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 that wasn't a good decision. But you know what, what happens? You, you, you know, you, you, you kill one and there's no, then there's 11 to deal with. You get the 11, now there's 1,000 to deal with. Get the 1,000, there's a million to deal with. They'll keep it up. Yeah. That's what we're going to see. I don't see anybody get killed, but <laughs> you can't fix this problem now. The infection, if you will, the poison is in the earth. Consider Hulk and Spider-Man. Do you know how they got their superpowers? Do you all know your comic books? How they got it is they got poisoned. Gamma rays. Spider-Man got bitten by a radioactive spider. It got poisoned. You know, a lot of the time, the truth of the kingdom of God feels like poison to us. Doesn't it? Sometimes. But you know what happens? So when that stuff gets in you, when that, those words of eternal existence get in you, what happens is you're like, just like the Hulk. Hopefully not the green part. There's, you're like Spider-Man. You know, you got your spidey senses. You know, somebody tossed something to me the other day and I grabbed it. I'm thinking my spidey senses are working. <laughs> Acts chapter 14. Now you think, okay, now this was Peter and John. They had walked with Jesus. So you're saying to yourself, well, yeah, but I never walked with Jesus. I never saw this right before my very eyes. And so that's why I think this fellow Paul comes on the scene. Because Jesus knew you were going to say that. This fellow Paul was not a disciple of Jesus. And in fact, he, if he did know Jesus, he knew Jesus from the other end of the scale. He wanted to get rid of this guy. In Acts chapter 14, we visit with Paul and in Lystra... A certain man without strength in his feet was, stand, was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leapt up and walked. And now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Leia Lake, Lycaonian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. What were they saying in our modern vernacular? They're acting like, excuse me, like Superman. Their context at the time was this, because their, their stories weren't like our stories. Their stories were Zeus and Apollo and F, uh, 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 Diana, they were sto mythological stories. So their way of saying this was, Zeus must have come down. Wow. This person must be Zeus because they're doing these supernatural, they'd heard about it in their little mythological stories. In our culture, we don't, have, we don't do that. We don't do myth, well, we do Thor, so it's kind of what we do. But we kind of have, we call it different things. 
And when, so when we look at what we're doing, we're saying these guys, Paul, a disciple of Jesus Christ, if we saw him do what he did then, we would say that guy's got superpowers. That's how we would define it. And then we can get context to our modern stories to match up to the fact that just like in Jesus's day, he was here using superpowers. His disciples show up on the scene. They start using superpowers. Paul comes on the scene after Jesus is gone, only submitting to the disciples at the time. And all of a sudden you see Paul's superpowers start to come out. Watch what happens in, in remember Malta? And now verse Acts 28. Now when they had escaped, they, this is the shipwreck, you remember that story? And now when they had escaped onto the beach, they found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives shows up, showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. Unusual kindness. Do you know what Paul, why Paul experienced unusual kindness? Because the door was open. Because Paul served other people, and so love was coming out of him. And when you love, people love you back. Can I tell you why bees don't bite? You think they bite? They don't bite. In the, God's way of doing it, only, they only bite you if you're afraid of them. If you're not afraid of them, they don't bite you. They come and they hang around you, but they won't bite you. They only bite because of the fear. Anyways, let's back over there. For they kindled a fire that made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, you know the story, laid it on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto Paul's hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, imagine what that looked like, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Right? Because they, they, their concept was of the gods. And so if you do bad things, the gods come and they make you have bad things happen to you. That's their context. And uh, whom, though he had escaped the sea, uh, yet justice would not allow him to live. That's what they thought. They kind of saw, that's the way they saw the world to be. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. But still, the people were expecting that he would swell up and fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time, imagine what that was like. All these natives of Malta were looking at you like, okay, yeah, anytime now, watch this, watch this. This is when he swells up. He looked for a long time and so no, saw that no harm had come to him. They changed their minds and said that he was a god. Again, we have the same context that we're, they're dealing with earlier in the book of Acts, where that was the way the world thought at the time that everything was the gods coming down in human form. And there's more scriptures there where, where we, we, we hear those kind of terminologies, the God came down in human form, referring to the disciples. What's God trying to tell us here? He's trying to tell us that when you abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask what you will and it will be done for you. That's a superpower. And when we start thinking about ourselves in that context as a little child coming into the kingdom, and when you come in the kingdom, we give you a cape. Imagine if we would all got that when we got in the door. Rather than a set of rules and regulations, somebody gave you a, t a cape and a spandex suit. Yeah, let's not, let's not do spandex. If we would have come into the kingdom understanding these scriptures from that context, that all of a sudden when I wake up tomorrow morning, then I go and I put my spidey suit on because I have a superpower. Now, every now and again, I got to jump into a phone booth and I got to zip out here because there's somebody in trouble and they need my superpower. Somebody needs a smile. Somebody needs a coffee. Somebody needs to be prayed for. Somebody needs to be encouraged. Somebody needs to be enlightened. Somebody needs to be empowered. That's my job. That's how I see it. I am infected with eternal existence that God factor on the inside of me. It is an, like a, a life force that the word of God 
puts on the, when you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide. That's a living dwelling. I dwell in there alive. When that is happening on the inside of us, we ask whatever we will. Using our superpower of servanthood. Most people that come into the kingdom, especially the faith camp, we say, okay, God, now I've learned faith. I want you to give me something. That's, you could do that, but that's not really the use of the superpower. The real use of the superpower is that we become servants. We just desire to serve everybody else with our superpower. Put your hand over your heart and say this with me. Say, Jesus, I desire to become a servant. I want to love as often as I can. Holy Spirit, show me when I have me on my mind a little too much because I want to be a servant. I want to develop my superpower and my superpower is love. God in me makes me a loving person. So Holy Spirit, exercise my superpower. Teach me to love even when it's hard for me to love. Those are the best kind. Those are the ones that build the biggest muscles. I desire to be just like Jesus. Jesus was a superhero. I'm a superhero. In Jesus' name.